Opponent. Since the Upanishad declares the vital force is withdrawn into fire, Chandogya 686, how can an erroneous meaning be asserted by saying that it goes to the ruler? Vedantin. That creates no difficulty, since in such activities as leaving the body, the soul plays the dominant part and any special point stated in other Upanishads has to be taken into account. Opponent, how then is the Upanishadic text to be explained that the vital force is withdrawn into fire? Tejas, Vedantin. Hence, the aphorist says, Sutra 5, Bhute Shu Tatshrute. The soul stays, Bhute Shu among the elements, tat shrute, that being so declared in the Upanishads. Translation, the soul comes to stay among the elements, it being so declared by the Upanishads. On the authority of the text, the vital force is withdrawn into fire. It is to be understood that this ruler, associated with the vital force, exists amidst the subtle elements that are associated with fire and constitute the seed of the body. Opponent. But that text shows the existence of the vital force in fire, and not the existence of the ruler accompanied by the vital force in fire. Vedantin. That is no defect, since in the aphorism, that one is merged in the ruler. It has been pointed out that the ruler also is to be understood as having been mentioned by the Upanishad, in between the vital force and fire. For one, who having gone from Shrugna to Matra, proceeds then to Pataliputra, may well be said to have proceeded from Shrugna to Pataliputra. Hence the text, the vital force is withdrawn into fire is to be understood to mean that it is the ruler, that is, soul, itself, associated with the vital force, that continues to stay amidst the subtle elements which are the associates of Tejas, fire. Opponent. Since fire alone is mentioned in the text, the vital force is withdrawn into fire, how can it be asserted that the ruler exists amidst the elements which have fire as an associate? Vedantin. Hence, the aphorist says, Sutra 6, Naikasmindarshayatohi, Na, not, Ekasmin, in a single one, He, for, Darshayataha, both show otherwise. Translation, the soul does not come to stay amidst a single element, for both the Upanishads and Smritis show otherwise. It is not a fact that at the time of the soul's desire to attain a new body, it exists in the midst of a single element, that is to say, fire, for the gross body is seen to be formed of many elements. The question and answer also reveal this in the passage starting with, Do you know how water comes to be called man when the fifth oblation is poured? Chandogya 5.3.3. That fact was explained under the aphorism, On account of water being constituted by three elements, the soul goes enveloped by all of them, though water is mentioned because of its preponderance. Brahmasutra 3.1.2. The Upanishadic and Smriti texts also point to this. The relevant Upanishadic texts runs thus. That self is identified with earth, water, air, space, and fire. Brihadaranyaka 445. The Smriti text is All this in the universe emerges as of yore, along with the five subtle elements that are indestructible. Manu 121. 
and so on. Opponent. With regard to the time when the soul wants to acquire a new body after the organs of speech, etc., are withdrawn, another Upanishadic passage starts with the sentence, Where is the man then? Brihadaranyaka 3.2.13 And then decides that the soul rests on the results of past works, karma. In the text, what they mentioned there was only karma, and what they praised there was also only karma. Ibidum. Vedantin. As to that, the answer is, the subject dealt with there is the emergence of bondage, which is constituted by the senses and sense objects, called the grahas, that is, perceivers, and atigrahas, that is, impellers of the perceivers, that is, objects of perception, and which is determined by past works. In this sense, it is said that the soul rests on karma, work, but the subject dealt with here is the creation of a fresh body from the materials, that is to say, the elements. In this sense, it is said that it rests on the elements. Besides, by using the word praise in the other text, that is, Brihadaranyaka, a mere predominance of karma is shown there. And it is not that any other resting place is also negated thereby. Hence, there is no contradiction. Namaste. So in this passage, we see the dangers of literal interpretation of the scriptures. We also see problems with not having complete knowledge of the scriptures. The difference between the opponent's point of view and Shankaracharya's point of view in the commentary is that the opponent wants to seize on the literal meaning of the words and say that that's the only meaning. But he is not considering the context, and Shankaracharya's context is vast. Huh? It's the whole of the Upanishads and Vedas, and even Itihasas like the Manusmriti. So, I mean, his background is so amazing, huh? And especially at his young age, when he wrote this commentary, I think he was like 16 or 18 years old. How can any human being get such complete knowledge of the Vedas in such a short time? It's not possible. So the only explanation is that Shankaracharya is some kind of divine incarnation, either of a sage or some say of Shiva himself. Well, that figures because the gross misinterpretations of the Upanishads were leading people astray into literal understanding of the scriptures. But as I never tire of saying, context determines meaning. So if your context is tiny and narrow, so your meaning will be. But if your context is broad, including the whole of the Vedas, then you will get the proper meaning. So this is why we say everything ultimately rests on consciousness. The four states of consciousness given in Mandukya Upanishad and expressed in our good old diagram here will show you exactly how to qualify every kind of statement in the scriptures according to the level of consciousness it addresses. In other words, what you see or what you understand in, for example, Jagrat consciousness consciousness of the external senses and world, is going to be very different from what you see and understand in Svapna consciousness, or consciousness of the inner world. See? So, to really understand the Vedas, you have to know all four states of consciousness. I mean by direct experience. Which is really no problem because we all have these four states of consciousness all the time. 
but we just don't recognize them because we don't know the meaning of the words. I have to come back to this again and again. If you can't recite the definition of a word, you don't know what it means. And especially the definition that is appropriate to the specific context in which the word is found. The small relationship words in English like for, up, with, that, and so on, <laughs> each have dozens of senses. And so you have to be able to discern, to discriminate, which sense applies in a specific context. And on top of that, be able to recite the definition. <laughs> or, once again, you don't know the meaning of the word. You're just throwing words around. You know, like ChatGPT. Why does ChatGPT and similar large language models make hallucinations, we call them? Well, they're actually errors, statistical errors, because an LLM, it incorrectly called an AI, it's not an AI. It's a large language model, which is a statistical representation of a vast corpus of text. And based on that statistics, the program picks the most likely next word or phrase in a particular expression. So in that way, it sometimes makes mistakes by getting the context wrong. And it can come up with Lulu's, I mean, <laughs> complete fabrications and present them very confidently as facts. And we all know people who do the same, maybe even ourselves. So, the meaning of the words is determined by the context. And knowledge of the meaning is necessary to have a cogent understanding and presentation of the actual meaning of any text. Especially in the scriptures, because the scriptures have, as I said, such a vast context, such a vast background. And it ranges all over the four states of consciousness. So, for example, the itihasas, like the Manusmriti, are about the external life and the laws of Vedic culture and civilization, and also explains why those laws exist and why they are the way they are. But when you get to bhakti, the bhakti scriptures, like the Puranas, they explain things in terms of the inner reality. So sometimes they talk about things that are apparently physically impossible. But that's no problem, because in the inner world, anything is possible. <laughs> so especially in the higher planetary systems, the possibilities vastly exceed what is possible on this earth planet. So we have to understand, you know, when the scriptures talk about things that seem to be outside of physical reality, well, that's because it is outside of physical reality. It's in mental reality or consciousness reality, the higher stages of Sushupti and Turiya. So in those states of consciousness, things are possible that are absolutely impossible in the lower states. And that's the way it should be. So to get down to specifics, Shankaracharya is saying that when the soul leaves the body at the time of death, it is understood to be resting on the elements. And when the Upanishads speak of one element, for example, in this case, fire, it really means fire, etc., including the other elements as well. And when the soul then comes to take a new body, it is said to rest on karma, because the karma, or the results of the previous activities, determines the range of bodies that it is qualified to take.
So this is why we stress again and again and again the performance of sadhana. I mean, here I am, 77 years old, and I've gone on a meteoric journey in my life from being a, a, a dumb Christian kid growing up in the New York suburbs <laughs> to being a pujari at the most wonderful temple in Sri Lanka. How did this happen? I had to go through things, stages of learning and practice so fast that I barely had time to finish one before I was moved on to the next. And sometimes it seemed like I was moving too fast to really digest everything. But, you know, God preserves what we have and carries what we lack as my Adi Guru used to say. So everything is there in the Vedas. And if we know the Vedas, if we come to see through the Vedas, this is called Shastra Chakshush. It means literally the eyes of the scripture. And when we see in that way, then we can understand everything in its proper context. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.